Um, glad to, uh, I mean, delighted to see the teams interacting in that way. Um, exactly what I hope to see um, coming in here and uh, votes well. Uh, so today is of uh, is split into you know two different sessions, right? And the first session we'll be having discussion um, related to uh, the last topic, the last video we went over. And then uh, for the tutorial session, we'll be hearing your ID zero comments, the incremental deliverable zero, right? Um, just as a reminder, ID one, incremental deliverable one is due on the 28th at midnight. Um, and We'll be having presentations on it next week on Tuesday, a week from today, uh, likely in the in the same um, tutorial slot. Now, um, uh, before we jump into some of the specifics of today's material, uh, I did want to answer one or two questions. So I I'd gotten a question from a student um, uh, on multi-level logging frameworks. This was a topic I brought up maybe last time, maybe it was the time before. I can't remember with clarity. Um, and and we did discuss um, sort of functionality that's expected in those frameworks. Can anyone remind us when we say a multi-level logging framework, what are we, I think we all know what logging is in a software development context, right? Um, it's output of diagnostic information, um, information that um, helps understand what's going on in the system, right? When we say multi-level logging, what are we what are we talking about? What's this notion of levels, and how does it relate to logging? Can anyone say? Uh, yes, uh, 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 Matthew. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same position or similar, similar. Logging yeah. up to grant different severities, different messages. And so when we're either at different stages, testing, validating, or running yep. production, we can control what issues we actually want to see for production. We don't have a lot of debug messages in place. Right. Right. But we can Yeah, so, so um, in case um, not everyone could hear that, um, those for the recording, I'll just note, Matthew noted that multi-level logging provides a tiered system, a, a system of, of different levels of, uh, he used the term severity, and it's not a bad bad term for it, urgency or, or uh, uh, seriousness, um, uh, level of concern um, uh, for, for different types of content. And he noted that at different times in the development process, different points, different processes that are undergoing, debugging on the one hand versus high-level testing versus perhaps user use or, or you know, um, uh, just uh, just testing out the user interface. Um, we might want very different levels of logging going on, might want very different levels of diagnostic information about what's happening in the system. And all that is true. But more than that, often multi-level logging, these different tiers, these di that's T-I-E-R-S, right? Um, we're not talking about different levels of, of, of weep weeping or lacrimonial distress. Um, those, those levels can be adjusted, the, the desired level, the level at which you wish to receive that information and more, to use his term, severe or more urgent. So typically you say, like, I want to get, you know, debugging messages at the level of warnings and worse, or at the level of error messages um, and worse, if there's any anything, right? Um, or at the level of inf information or worse. When we do that, we can do so at runtime, typically. And this is important at several levels. One thing is during debugging, it lets us throttle back or or up the level of logging, right? So when we're debugging a system, 
we can use very little logging potentially until we're in the area of the system that we want to debug. And then we could throttle up the level of logging going on, the amount uh, the the amount that we see. It's I, I shouldn't say the level of logging necessarily, uh, but it's it's the amount that's actually output, right? Um, the amount that actually yields some some output. Now, um, similarly, um, we may notice you know a problem, and we want to respond to it by trying to diagnose what's going, you know, trying to get an understanding of what's going on, and we may throttle up the amount of logging. Um, if we're testing the system and testing certain areas, particularly for white box testing, we might want to really ramp up the amount of testing and the amount of logging that we see. Now, multi-level logging frameworks often provide a lot of additional conveniences. Um, you may be most familiar with logging going to where? Where, where do you commonly see logging messages? When, when you're working in past projects, maybe 370, 270, where would you see log messages go to? Where would you see these logging messages? Don't tell me the, the, the forest. Um, yes. Uh, the terminal. The terminal, the console, right? But in general, contemporary logging frameworks are much more flexible than that. Where else might you reasonably want logging messages to, to end up or be recorded beyond the console, beyond the, the terminal or you know, some interactive environment in which you're in. What where else? Yeah, yes. Uh Matthew? No, not Matthew. Sorry. Uh Mitchell? No. Okay. Uh Jesse. Okay, okay, okay. Eventually I'm right. Clock's right twice a day. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesse. You can have like a log yeah. Good. A, a log file, right? Putting it out to a log file. Any other ideas? Where else might you want log messages to end up to be recorded? Uh, Matthew, uh, again, yeah. A uh, recording external service like Sentry. Yes. It, good, good. So, so sometimes we have infrastructure set up to handle these sort of diagnostic uh, messages, and we might want to route them to there. Databases is another place you might put some log messages. Um, um, some might go to tools like Crashlytics that are crash analytics tools. What When I say crash analytics tools, it should be tools you think about. When we talk about offensive programming, proactively taking the fight to the bugs. You know, we talk about taking a fight to the enemy uh, proactively, taking, taking the fight directly to the defects. One part of this um, is planning around building in crash analytics. What do we mean by crash analytics? Anyone? Sorry? You mentioned crashing. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> if I crash into Linux, I'm in trouble because I've got to do a head plant like on this computer because um, it is it is running Linux. and. Um, trust me, uh, you don't want to see it. Well, okay, M maybe at least I don't want to see it, right? Um, you you might find it rather uh, rather interesting. Um, no crash analytics. It means if we're going to crash, let's be prepared. Remember, chance favors the prepared. Um, by being prepared ahead of time, by being proactive. You can remember risk management, right? By by having something in place, if this happens, think about contingency planning. If this happens, you know we're going to do this. And crash analytics are all about that. If there's going to be a crash, we're going to record a heck of a lot of information, maybe about the operating system, the amount of memory that was underway, the the version of the software being used, the version of libraries that were installed. All these types of things about the the environment, maybe recent log messages at different levels, and we'll bundle that information up, and then like ET, we'll phone home. We'll we'll call back to the server and post information that the system crashed. Why might we do that? What why would why would we want that sort of information, Jesse? Yeah. Um, doing. 
to the bug deal with. Like it's a very niche based thing that people are reporting on crashes and it's kind of figure it out yourself if you look at the bad networks and see what the state That's right. That, that's exactly right. We could, we could, we could see a lot of contextual information about when the, to use a, a rough word, crash occurred, right? When the failure occurred, a lot of contextual information about what was going on. What else could we? Why else is that information of use? We use this all the time in our deployed systems. Why? Why? Well. If we're deploying apps for use around the country, around Saskatchewan, around the world, like some of the apps we've built, um, we want to know if failures are going on, right? We, we want to know if failures are happening. And this provides us information about how often the app is failing, in what context it's failing, in what part of the system it's failing, what the user was in the midst of doing, and that helps us recognize quality issues with our software, right? So in this class, many teams have made use. In fact, it's strongly encouraged to make use of tools for crash analytics. Um, Crashlytics is a product that some teams have used. Um, uh, there's actually a product called Crashlytics that, that serves in this capacity, but there's there's a whole category of software around crash analytics. Um, and that can help you analyze what's going on, parse what's going on, take all that information you packed up, the stack trace, all this information about recent activity, about the OS version, structure it for you, let you see at an overview what types of crashes are occurring across your whole installed base of users. Can you see why that information is useful? Yes. Uh, uh, Kamal. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to double check if I understood this right. Touche. Yes. Um, crash analytics is a type of multi-level logging that specifically logs crash reports. You you could say that. Yeah. Um. Uh. I mean, crash analytics. Um. I'm not gonna say. I mean, it's multi-level in the sense that you're getting different levels of information. I'm, I'm not going to say that it's multi-level in the sense you can, well, probably, yes, you can adjust. Yes, what, what information is brought over? Maybe for privacy reasons, right? Maybe you, you want to provide guarantees to your users that you're not going to um, record some information about what they were they're doing, right? Or the data that was in memory at the time, et cetera. So yes, you can adjust that information. That's true. You can throttle it up, throttle it back, but it's specifically focused at the point of system failure, right? It's it's used specifically when the system fails. This is this is crash, anal crash analytics. The idea behind that, the idea of logging failures and putting in place proactive handling of those failures. Um, that's that. That's uh, one use of multi-level uh, types of logging, but it's a particularly specialized use. I hope that's helpful. We'll lead. It was, yeah. So the multi-level aspect of is your ability to tune up or down. Mm -hmm. kind of yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I wouldn't get too distracted on that. I, I made a kind of analogy, and I think it, it fairly holds. But multi-level logging is much more general than that. It's really about as the program is running, you can throttle up or throttle down the amount of information you get and what that requires of you, dear viewers, is uh, in your code, placing calls to logging frameworks that basically say, hey, log this informational message, log this information, log this other message at the level of debugging, log this other one at the level of warnings log this other one at the level of an error that has occurred. So in your code, I will look, I will seek, I will aspire to find these calls to these logging frameworks that will log different types of information. And just recognize that whether it's Kamal or Walid looking at it, um, that they can sometimes choose to to see only the messages as it's running this time, which are at the error level. In other words, the most urgent types of messages. Other times they may 
dial it up to get messages at the debugging level, like maybe when it's connecting to a remote server to log a message saying, trying to connect to tunnel.ustas.ca. And then it will log another message saying, you know, connected uh, successfully or whatever. These are the sorts of information that Kamal or even Waleed would find useful. Uh, very good. Yeah, two for one there. Um, okay. So multi-level logging is uh, a really, investing in multi-level logging is a strategic investment in giving you flexibility to debug more effectively, to test more effectively, to understand system operation more effectively, and to take advantage, to, to take better advantages, to better learn from those mistakes which happen with crashes, okay? Make use of it, take it from an old man, okay? Okay, so, so that was something about um, multi-level logging. Um, I got asked uh, as well about smoke tests and where they come into systems. I, I wanna remind you, I, I, I've said it from this stage before, but I'm, I'm gonna remind you again, as I am one, that uh, when it comes to ID one, incremental deliverable one, um, traditionally a lot of project teams have put a lot of their effort for development into uh, spike prototypes. What's a spike prototype? Throwaway code that serves to reduce risk. And how does it reduce risk? It tests your understanding, it confirms your understanding of the technologies involved. Particularly if, for example, a pair of technologies play nicely together. Do they work well together? Or it'll test that your understanding is sound about how a technology works, right? Um, you may be working with TypeScript for the first time, or maybe you're working with Playwright, or maybe you're working with um, some some particular React library, uh, Passport, or what have you, and you want to you want to test your understanding of how it works. So you you set your development on a, a solid path as you start to implement things. You can put in place spike prototypes for that, and I will value those. Um, just as much as other code base additions. So, so don't think like you got to rush off and get a features implemented for ID one. I mean, that's great if you have a few features started, but a lot of ID ones are often composed of these spike prototypes. And sometimes that's all that's provided in terms of working code. Um, yes, Matthew. Uh, with regards to submitting, because normally our submission will be the tag. Yes. Version mm. on whatever we consider to be our master branch. Yeah. Since pipes are throwaways, can yeah. they just be like setting up in a closed MR on the repository as like this is what we tried, and then the MR describes what we tried, what, what worked, what did, and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, I I'd prefer if you could give us tags to look at. So so maybe they're not all. You're right on, um, the 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 trunk, the, the main branch. But if you could give us tags that we could use to look at them or otherwise to look at the code so we can assess what was tested and how seriously you, you looked into using it and the extent of that, I, that's what we'd be seeking, okay? And uh, that takes the place of code on the main branch and, and, and I'd like to to see, um, yeah, I'd like to see some some good information provided on what you've looked at. Also documented, give me some, in, I mean, so give me some information about it, say what they were used for to give us context, right? Because we have to interpret these things in order to, to mark them. Um, so when it, when it comes to smoke tests, what's the role of a smoke test? We can remember, what's the role of a smoke test? What's the basic job of a smoke test? And how does it differ from other tests? So Bob's, um, smoke test is just like that basic functionality is still working. That's right. Basic functionality app. Because look, if recent commits to the app, if recent um 
you know, recent pushes have, have introduced code that fundamentally breaks the app. Um, maybe, you know, two recent commits are not playing nicely together, right? And, 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 and the app can't even, you can't really log into it. You can't even use it worth beans. It's not functional. That's going to be, that's not going to deliver value for the team to pull it down, right? Um, that's going to cause problems because it's going to get in the way of UI testing, get in the way of further development, et cetera. And, and so you want to know that. And the smoke test serves to confirm that at least some very, very basic functionality is in place. How does that differ from other types of testing? Can anyone say? What, what's the goal by and large of other types of testing? Yes. Um, is it Walid or is it Kamal this time? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, it's, it's just your goal is to have as much coverage as you can in your code and then also just look at any possible situations of failure. So yeah. you seek out failure as opposed to just- That's right, to... that's right. Yeah, we're, we're trying to um, test, um, evaluate whether the system is working and identify defects, right? Identify, and 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 we're actually detecting, I should say that again, we're, we're identify points of failure in the system that we can then investigate, really. And that's what's going on with most testing, right? Whereas, as Bob said, the goal of a smoke test is really to confirm that enough essentials of the system are working that it's worth people you know, pulling down this these latest contributions. Because if that's not the case, we need to talk with the people who made the latest latest pushes and 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 get them to fix this problem. We have to jump on top of it, or we'll be delivering, you know, negative value to everyone in the team. We'll be potentially blocking further development. Okay. So so this is an important point. And so, you know, look, I mean, as far as smoke tests in place for IV1. I think it's going to be absolutely minimal. Some teams are going to only submit spike prototypes. And, and I don't expect a, a smoke test for that. If, if you have a login screen up, um, you could start to think about a smoke test that might log in with default credentials and log out or something like that. And, and that would be a good step. But I'm not, I'm not going to really... Um, you know, I'm not going to require every team submit a, a, a smoke test. But you see what you can do, and over time, the smoke test evolves. Why does the smoke test evolve? Why does it evolve in big ways as development proceeds? Yes, come on. Come on. Because what we consider to be basic functionality expands. Yeah, what the, the feature set, the feature set as it expands um, means that the notion of what's basic functionality and even even how certain parts of the system are packaged changes. So logging in may occur via different mechanisms over time. Um, there may be different, you know, the, the functionality once you get logged in may be quite different, right? Um, uh, so so it will it will change, yeah. Um, so smoke tests are something I, I'd like to see built during the semester. And ID1 often they're very, very simple if they exist at all. So I hope that's helpful my comments on on expectations okay okay so that's what